with his trademark whip, wide-brimmed hat, a pistol, and charm to spare. You have your father's eyes. And my mother's ears. But the rest belongs to you. Indiana Jones leapt onto movie screens and turned archaeology into adventure. Damn, I thought that was closer. Now, find out the facts behind his exciting exploits. The history of archaeology is about treasure. The latest technologies. The bullwhip and the gun has been replaced with computers. The real dangers. Our site is swarming with horned vipers. You're dead in less than a minute. And we don't have the antidote. I hate snakes! And the timeless pursuits. I've got what I think is the real holy grail. Ride with Indiana Jones. We got company! Nice landing. Thanks. And uncover the secrets of history on the ultimate quest. There's nothing to fear here. That's what scares me. On June 12th, 1981, Raiders of the Lost Ark premiered in movie theaters across the world and introduced audiences to a fearless archaeologist named Indiana Jones. <sighs> Created and produced by George Lucas and directed by Steven Spielberg, Raiders quickly became one of the most successful motion pictures of all time. It also set a new standard for adventure films by digging deep into the past and recapturing the cliffhanging spirit of 1930s movie serials. Throughout the decade, Indy was off and running in a continuing series of adventures filled with action. Suspense. Comedy. Hit! Are we hit? More or less. Romance. I don't like fast women. And I hate arrogant men. And more than enough spectacle to keep everyone glued to their seats. But the Indiana Jones series didn't just rekindle audience interest in adventure films. It also focused a spotlight on the real-life science of archaeology. I first saw the Indiana Jones movies when I was a teenager, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark in particular, um, you know, ignited a, a passion in me for the past and for history and for archaeology that's never really faded away. Most archaeologists, if they're honest, will tell you that the Indiana Jones movies inspired them to do what they're doing. I know that was the case for me. I saw those movies and I said, I want to go someplace else, someplace different. I want to go discover new things. I didn't know you could fly a plane. Why, yes! Land, go! Indiana Jones and his adventures, they offer us the possibility of traveling. When we were kids watching those movies and we see those airplanes traveling across the maps and these exotic locales and these faraway places and digging in these worlds that we've heard about or read in books, but the cameras bring us there to see it. That was exciting. Where are they digging for the Well of the Souls? On that ridge. Let's go. Come on. Indiana Jones is the one who made history sexy. The extraordinary accomplishment of the Indiana Jones series is taking something that is the life of the mind and turning it into something action-packed and heroic. Let her go. But well, we had volunteers come on our excavations. They came 
primarily because they saw the Indiana Jones movies. And I remember they would ask me questions like, uh, so are there any trap doors around here? Or do we have any hidden corridors? People were very much inspired by the movie and that sense of adventure. This is it. We found it. It's the same as on the Grail tablet. His romance with the past is something that I think um, all archaeologists feel deeply. Just like your father. Kitty is a schoolboy. <laughs> And he really incorporates an awful lot of the deep history of archaeology.
the second Indiana Jones adventure, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Indy and his companions find themselves deep within an underground temple. Nobody's seen this for a hundred years. It is ruled by the evil Mola Ram. The high priest of a horrifying cult called the Thuggies. The Thuggy cult in the Temple of Doom is based on a real cult that existed, it's believed, from about the 14th century. The word thug in English comes from that cult. They would travel with people and then murder them. They would trick them and murder them. In the film, the Thuggies are after five sacred Shankara stones, egg-shaped rocks that each provide health and prosperity to all who possess them. But, when brought together, endow their owner with awesome, and in the wrong hands, evil powers. Named after Shankara, the 8th century philosopher credited with reviving Hinduism, the stones in the film are actually based on the Shiva Lingam stones found in the shallow riverbeds of the sacred Narmada River in central India. Shiva Lingam stones represent Shiva, the god of creation, and just as in the film, are worshipped by Hindus for their healing energy. Some even believe them to have godlike powers. You will become a true believer. <laughs> in order to keep their followers in a state of mass hypnosis, the Thuggies force them to swallow hallucinogenic drugs and opiates. But just how plausible is this? Were there, in fact, ancient cults who controlled their followers' minds in this way? Deep within the mountains of Peru, archaeologist John Rick is exploring just such a possibility. Amidst the remnants of an ancient civilization that existed between 900 and 200 BC, called the Chavin. Chavin is very much a cult. Cult to me is, has a lot to do with being in or out. You're in a cult or you're out of a cult. You don't come into a cult easily. You paid a price to come in. Admission wasn't free. We see a lot of evidence of the use of psychoactive plants. Substances that would have been given by the priests to people perhaps coming into the cult of Chavin in an attempt to control their minds. So it's a form of mind control by a priesthood that appears to know just how to use that. So here we are deep in the temple of Chavin. A place like this just goes to show you how real life Indiana Jones is. He would have loved a location like this, full of mysteries. You can imagine priests bringing in here the converts to the cult. You'd be coming in here probably after congesting drugs. You'd come in in the dark. You'd be walking down a passageway that makes no sense to you at all. Coming along, hearing the reverberation of your voice in these spaces. Step where I step. And don't touch anything. Sound gets really crazed. It's, nothing's quite normal in here. You know, you're beginning to see things, you're getting ideas. Go! There, go! You're here in the side chamber, your eyes are getting accustomed to the dark, but there's no light in here. So your eyes are dilating and dilating. Drugs may be doing part of that on their own. Then, out of nowhere, comes a stream of light, straight down the passageway that you came through, and it strikes the land zone with a raking light that brings out this terrifying object with an engraved image of a grinning combination of human and animal. These priests have something going on. They're reaching into my brain. They're showing me stuff that no human should see. I think it'd be really a, a terrifying thing, really. Would have led to many of them eventually joining. Indy! For God's sake, help me! What's the matter with you? In a terrifying scene in Temple of Doom, the character of Willie comes very close to meeting her own death 
when she is strapped to a hanging altar, about to be sacrificed to the god Kalima. But is this ritual of bloody sacrifice based more on fact than fiction? The answer lies in the desert of northern Peru, in a temple that dates back 1700 years. Called Huacacao Viejo, it was one of the largest earthen temples built anywhere in the world. The Huacacao Viejo in Peru has been described as the Temple of Doom because it has these pictures of sacrificial victims. Incredibly gruesome kinds of things, decapitating people, and amazing scenes of the past that, that shock us. Archaeologist Regulo Franco Jordan has spent the last 18 years excavating the ruins of Temple Huacacao Viejo and piecing together the religious rituals of the Mochi culture that worship there. Los Mochicas grabaron sus ceremonias en los muros del templo. Esta es la figura del decapitador Mochica. Esta figura demuestra que en la época Mochica ellos realizaban sacrificios humanos. Y prueba de esto es de que esta divinidad está llevando en su mano izquierda ¿cierto? una cabeza humana separada de su cuerpo. In an especially gruesome scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, a prisoner has his heart extracted from his body while he is still alive. But did this practice really take place? Aquí en la parte alta de la pirámide Mochica se desarrollaban los sacrificios humanos. Y uno de los tipos de sacrificios humanos era la extracción del corazón del individuo que era algo sangriento, un evento ceremonial con mucho derroche de sangre y quizás con la presencia de mucha gente. La película de Indiana Jones no está lejos de esta realidad practicada por los mochicas hace muchos siglos atrás. But not all of the gruesome rituals seen in the Temple of Doom have been abandoned. Some have survived. And we can find evidence of this in the witch's market in Peru, where objects used for black magic are bought and sold. Estas muñecas hacen una tradición, digamos, personas que quieren hacer maldad. Maldad es brujería mala. Invierten cosas de alfileres, alfileres entre medio de esto de acá de los dos, y luego entierran en un cementerio y hacen maldad. Este es para maldad. Temples like Huacacao Viejo are exciting finds for human history. But how does working in a location where human beings have been ritually sacrificed affect the work of archaeologists? Are they ever haunted by the souls of those who died? Well, actually, some very strange things happened at Huacacao Viejo one night when we were up on top of the pyramid watching the sun go down and we saw some very unexplained phantasms, I guess is the best word for it. They were kind of blobby shaped things down below us that looked kind of human-like and they were moving. And it could have been the fog. Maybe we just wanted to see these things, but it did freak us out, all out a little bit. Siempre hemos dicho nosotros los arqueólogos que estas huacas están con espíritus que nos acompañan en toda nuestra vida, en toda nuestra labor científica. De modo de que estamos frente a espíritus que están viviendo dentro de esta pirámide mochica. Are the remnants of the past not just in the forms of rocks, but also spirits? How do archaeologists deal with digging on sacred ground? But you see, even today, archaeologists usually hire a shaman to do the rituals in order to perform the excavations. He will be the way to communicate with the dead people 
what happens is that you have to make an agreement with them in order to take things from them. If you don't do that, of course you are you're in danger. When I come across, especially human remains, I don't feel guilty about the things that I'm, that I'm finding. This is my science and this is what we do. But there is a deep and profound respect I have for the people that lived here. Why does the floor move? Give me your torch. Snakes. Why do they have to be snakes? Asps. Very dangerous. You go first. Booby traps. Hostile natives. Corpse ridden tombs. And all manner of creepy creatures. Oh, rats. Are just part of an average working day in the life of Indiana Jones. Come on, show a little backbone, will ya? But just how do Indy's fictional dangers compare to those faced by real life archaeologists? I, too, hate snakes. I hate them. A number of snakes in Egypt are deadly. I don't want to die for my profession. So I've been in some countries where there are snakes in the caves. So we basically have to take stones, throw into the cave to make sure you know, they're not there. The horned viper is about less than a foot long and it has two little horns on its head. It has a poison that affects the central nervous system. You have 25 minutes to get the antidote if you are bitten. And we are about 30 minutes from the hospital and we don't have the antidote. So I think you can understand why we don't want to work in those caves in the summertime. <laughs> We're in an area, Kanquen means nest of serpents in Kekchi, and I've never seen so many snakes. Now some of them are hunting snakes, and they're stupid, and they think you're part of their food. So every once in a while somebody gets bitten by a, a fer de lance, Barbara Maria, as they call them, that, and you're dead if they bite you. I said, cut it out! Shalpate, which is another snake that, um, it's like a slinky. It sort of curls up and gets fat and then jumps through the air and bites. But they're stupid and they miss most of the time. And I mean, I've seen them hit a tree and spray this stuff out and it's funny. And I don't want to ruin the romance, but tarantulas do not bite you. They're cute, nice, furry animals. Our kids keep them as pets, uh, but they just climb all over you and they don't bite you. But what is deadly in the jungle are the mosquitoes. Every time a mosquito bites you, you're getting an injection. I've had malaria twice. Name a disease I've had it, and it's from the bugs. So snakes run away, scorpions are just obnoxious, Tarantulas are cute, uh, but the mosquitoes are deadly. Okay, so it's safe to conclude that real-life archaeologists deal with the same slithering, slimy, venomous vermin that plague Indy's adventures. But what about dangers of a more mysterious and supernatural kind? There is a cemetery at Giza where at least one of the tombs has hieroglyphic curses threatening anyone who violates the tomb that he the violator will be eaten by a crocodile or killed by a hippopotamus it occasionally happens that there are curses like that lord carnivon who sponsored howard carter's excavations at king tut's tomb died a year or so after the discovery 
And this gave rise to a lot of speculation that there was a mummy's curse. Few people, though, that hold to this don't note the fact that Howard Carter himself, the archaeologist who not only discovered the tomb, but was the first one to enter it, lived for another 10 years after its discovery. And so most likely, Lord Carnarvon died from something else. Cuando se encuentre una tumba, en realidad, bueno, de que sienta algo extraño, pues, no lo siento. Pues tampoco me aterro, porque en realidad sé que, que, que la persona que, que estamos encontrando ya está muerta. Y, y pues, bueno, yo tengo la creencia que, bueno, no soy supersticioso, yo sé que no me va a hacer daño. Some people, when they discover tombs for the first time, there's not a lot of air in there because it's been sealed for so many centuries. There's a musty smell. You can't breathe well. And they begin to feel funny. You could see how people might start to think that, ooh, could this be a curse of some sort? But in most cases, it's cave fever, which can be caused by ticks, um, bacteria, fungi on the walls. That a person, they put their hands on the walls and they touch it to their mouth, to their nose, um, can, you know, affect themselves with um, various kinds of uh, diseases that could, if untreated, kill them. Of course, not all of Indy's obstacles are otherworldly. Some of them involve hostile natives or nations at war. People trying to kill him. I know that! It's a experience for me. It happens to me all the time. Oh, there are many aspects of Indiana Jones that are real life. There are many archaeologists that can tell you stories about bandits that held them up or living out in the wild and getting dirty and eating terrible food. You do not eat him? I have bugs for lunch. <laughs> There are plenty of physical dangers, difficulties, discomfort. In Cyprus, we have to get in a fishing boat every morning. We fight very strong currents. We have to land on big rocks. It's very difficult to get there. Once there, we have to climb a 21-meter cliff just to commute to work every morning. We have capsized. It's a terrifying thing to watch your students floating out to sea with backpacks and with Princeton University's $15,000 laser theodolite. We saved it. I hate these guys. I used to say that archaeology was nothing like Indiana Jones because, you know, you don't get shot at by Nazis. Uh, then we got shot at by the Hezbollah. So the names have changed, but the action and the adventure is still there. Some of the areas in the Middle East, we have to take a bulletproof bus, you know, to certain areas. You always have to be cautious. If you look at the map, um, I have not been able to dig in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon. Most of these countries that were available and very active in archaeology right through into the 70s are no longer as viable. The truth is, we dig in areas where there's modern disputes, be they political disputes or religious disputes, and these disputes carry over into your daily life. One day you might be digging and you'll hear some explosions and you gotta get out of town. Uh, and you go to Tiberias where you figure uh, nobody can touch me here, and then a shell goes off about 100 feet from me and blows you into the trunk of a car. You know, just ordinary days on site. I worked on a project in Ethiopia for 10 years. In 1998, a war broke out. We saw a bomb drop one night, and we had to get out of there. Um, the American ambassador called me up, and he told me, get out of there, but he didn't tell me how. So then we had to find a vehicle that would take us 360 kilometers through the highest mountains in Ethiopia on a one-lane dirt road that had been built by the invading fascist Italian army in 1935. It was a bit too much of an adventure, to tell you the truth. But perhaps the greatest danger Indiana Jones faces is from rival archaeologists. Jones. Wily competitors who will stop at nothing to beat Indy to the proverbial punch. Oh. The truth is that there's, there's always some kind of rival, some nemesis, some archaeologist that's at odds with the way that you interpret a side. We come in! 
So I may interpret a site one way, he may interpret it differently, or she may want to say that it argues for something else. And so maybe I don't have a guy shooting at me with a gun trying to take away the thing I found, but there are these types of rivalries in archaeology, camps if you will, that want to I explain things differently. You chose the wrong friends. This time it will cost you. Too bad the Jovitos don't know either way I do, Belloc. You could warn them, if only you spoke Jovitos. There is competition among archaeologists, but the one that has the most resources or the most money, of course they have the, the you know, upper hand. But most of the time, a large percentage is who you know. It's good to make friends. People will open up doors and opportunities for you. Meet me at Omar's. Be ready for me. I'm going after that truck. Oh, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. But no matter where or how far Indy's journeys take him, one thing is fairly certain. When he returns home, the world of academia can be even more frightening than the darkest, spookiest tomb. I-T-H-I-C, meaning stone. Many of us are actually have academic positions where you have to teach. And we do have ditzy female students, just like Indiana Jones. But we never have girls in love with archaeology teachers. I've never found that to be the case. What I really liked in the Indiana Jones, the one thing I really loved, when he goes back to the university. And it's just like when I go back to the university. It's just culture shock and terrible. So, and I'll see each and every one of them in turn. They're turning in their papers and they want to know about their grades and did he read their papers and he's besieged in his office. That was very realistic. That was dead on. Look at this. It's worthless. Ten dollars from a vendor in the street. But I take it, I bury it in the sand for a thousand years, it becomes priceless. For centuries, people have been digging in the dirt, looking for treasure. Alright! Pick it up! Easy! And the line between discovering the past and stealing it has remained a very gray one. So once again, Jones, what was briefly yours is now mine. One of the problems we have today is looting. This is treasure hunting. A lot of people think of this as archaeology and it's not. As long as people have been buried with anything of value, there have been looters around. The Romans looted Greece, the Visigoths looted Rome, and then European colonialists looted just about everybody. The looting of archaeological sites and the sale of, uh, of artifacts from those sites. Starting in the 20th century, it's become a very big business. It's an example of people digging to find the past, and then really trying to own the past. And they don't ask anybody's permission, they just take it. The northern coast of Peru has a long history of looting because for a long time ceramics from the north coast of Peru were very very popular on the international antiquities market. There are sites in, in places that have been very very heavily looted. It looks like you're looking at the moon. I mean, it's full of all these craters. It's all these places where these gigantic pits have been dug out by looters looking for those phenomenally valuable artifacts that they sell at the market. Here we are in Huaricanga. It's one of many archaeological sites on the coast of Peru that haven't seen much investigation. And you can see right away, just entering the site, that it's been looted. Um, you don't have to look very far to see the gleam of human bone. So, over here, walk in, pick up a human vertebra, upper end of a mandible, human jaw, what looks to be uh, the lower end of the humerus, the upper arm bone, 
all of this material probably came right out of this pit here where somebody scooped out all sorts of human bone and they're going after pottery if they're really lucky maybe they're going to find a few pieces of metal some gold something like that so there was a tomb here the evidence thrown out of the ground left on the surface it's against the law to do this in peru but this is a very common scene to see in the days of indiana jones paying big money for ancient artifacts was a common practice inside are the remains of nuhachi the first emperor of manchu dynasty welcome home old boy <laughs> and now you give me the diamond but in spite of recent international laws the black market for looted items continues to thrive the illicit antiquities trade is a very big commercial business it is third only to drug trade and weapons trade um, somewhere in the vicinity of over six or seven billion dollars a year if you see antiquities on the market being sold more often than not they have been looted many people don't realize that when they buy an object from an antiquity shop that they are actually feeding a food chain of events certain kinds of antiquities now come in and out of vogue on the illicit antiquities market with great frequency see this great eruption of looting in uh, southern Iraq for ancient cylinder seals, cuneiform tablets that are right now very coveted on the international antiquities market. There are other reasons for the, this upsurge in looting in Iraq as well. I think there are some collectors who really are interested in buying things that are known to be illegal or who, some collectors who like to walk on the wild side. They want it so it can be a prize on their mantle or they want it for their personal collection. What are the consequences of such a big industry? How far does the destruction go? A looted artifact can go through many hands, from looter to smuggler to middleman to another middleman to another middleman to a dealer, and then finally to a buyer. Well, then all the information that you had on the base has probably been lost. And part of the whole game of the antiquities trade is to hide the origin of pieces. Let's say a coin is found. They take that coin out. And that coin could have dated that entire now missing building. You have just destroyed an important piece of history by taking that out. And you may think there's nothing there, but there's never nothing there. From an archeological point of view, the collectors and the looters are causing irreparable damage to the history of humanity. We're lacking resources and must fight looters and traffickers. This is the permanent drama of archaeology all over the world. It's very hard for a poor country to develop the kind of resources needed to monitor an ancient site. But it's not just a question of wealth and poverty, it's also a question of political will and uh, developing an ethic among people who live in rural areas, who live among great archaeological uh, riches, not to see them as a windfall to be exploited. One site in Guatemala, rich in artifacts and history, was saved when locals joined forces with archaeologist Arthur Demarest to take on the looters. And I got engaged in this big battle with the looters in 2004 and 2005. The looters are heavily armed and they kill people. People dying out there. There's Maya dying out there. But when the Maya helped us for the first time to hunt down these looters, recapture the monuments, was a real turning point because the government realized that the only way you were really going to protect these sites was to engage the communities. If you work from the beginning with a site, you train the people, you create a park, they run it, there's no looting. I mean, you try to loot, there's going to be like 700 angry Maya with machetes and a few rifles. And so they don't do it. The Maya said, this is our heritage, and don't screw with it. 
Like most archaeologists, Indiana Jones's motivations have been clear from the start to keep valuable objects out of the hands of the bad guys. Small world, Dr. Jones! This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. It belongs in a museum. Um, the rule of thumb is whichever state that you're digging, that government gets whatever you find. I don't get to take any of it home. Cairo, a paradise on earth. In the days of Indiana Jones, archaeologists could go into Egypt, into ancient Mesopotamia, these places, excavate artifacts, take them back to their museums, and there were no antiquity laws that really controlled removal of artifacts. Over the years, of course, laws have developed, and it's against the law in most countries to remove artifacts from their location. They're really regarded as property of the state. There's a great movement now for repatriation of pieces. That is, countries of origin are demanding the restitution of pieces that they feel or they have some evidence to show were uh, looted or clandestinely excavated in their countries. Of course, during decades of the 19th century, a lot of artifacts went away from our countries. Uh, and they are uh, now in some important museums, also abroad. They are some important collections that people think that should be here. Of course they have a symbolic meaning and also they are taken by the national community as symbols of identity. This sense of national pride is illustrated by the villagers in the Temple of Doom. In the film, Indy gives back the Shankara stones to the people of the village. It is an act of selflessness that reflects the maturity of thought and attitude found in many of today's archaeologists. Yes. I understand its power now. Indiana Jones, throughout all of his adventures, offers a sense of respect for the sacred object. So no matter what it is, if it's a Jewish object, if it's a Christian object, if it's, if it's the, the crystals from the Temple of Doom, each one of these objects, the sacred gets treated with respect. So that's a very important lesson. You could have kept it. Uh, what for? They just put it in a museum, it'd be another rock collecting dust. I believe that if he was working in 2008, Indiana Jones would be a great proponent of cultural heritage protection, and he would be on the front lines helping law enforcement stop the illicit trade in antiquities. Now, finally, governments are starting to uh, work more diligently to crack down on this trade. We saw this very recently in the west coast of the United States where five museums were accused by uh, prosecutors of having received looted materials. What is the future of looting? It is my greatest hope that we are today where ecology and conservation were 35 years ago. It is everybody's problem. It is not archaeologists versus collectors. It is not museums versus scientists. A true archaeologist, somebody who's given their life to research, wants an artifact so that it can benefit all of, of humanity, all of humankind. The human record is our shared legacy. It belongs to everyone. And when we lose it, everyone loses. And it's our responsibility to pass both of these things on to future generations intact. Bingo. You don't disappoint, Dr. Johns. That's right. There's a knight of the first crusade down here. That's where we'll find him. In his search for precious objects, Indiana Jones uses some pretty basic tools. Let's face it. Other than his gun, his whip, his fists, and his wits, there's really not much technology involved. Archaeology is not an exact science. But remember, Indy was working in the 1930s. Times have changed greatly, and archaeologists no longer practice archaeology or hunt for objects in the way that Indiana Jones did. The modern archaeologist is very, very much a scientist and a detective. Developments in new technology are happening at lightning speed. 
It's a very exciting time to be an archaeologist. These range from DNA analysis to radiocarbon dating, new advances in computer data collection and modeling, as well as robotics in deep underwater excavation. As technology advances, how do the new methods benefit archaeologists in the field? One of the newest and most exciting methods recently introduced to archaeology is GPR. GPR is an acronym for ground penetrating radar. It is a device that will allow us to look down into the ground and map archaeological sites without ever turning a shovel full of dirt in advance. And that way we can plan excavations, we can save a lot of time, focus our energy on specific areas. Ground penetrating radar was actually developed by the U.S. government and the military to look for tunnels in Vietnam. Roman sites are really great for ground penetrating radar because Romans built such substantial buildings and foundations. This is a Roman temple that we found at the site of Petra in present-day Jordan. And it was in an area that was flat, it had no architecture, and we did ground penetrating radar in this area, and right in the middle of this open field was a buried Roman temple. It was amazing. And what was so amazing about it is as we were collecting the ground penetrating radar, we could see the temple appearing on the computer screen almost in real time. And sure enough, there it was, in an area where nobody had a clue such a thing was still preserved under the ground. While GPR is helping archaeologists find artifacts buried at existing sites, how are new sites found in the first place? Surprisingly, one answer can be found not on the ground, but in the sky. Thanks to NASA's newest generation of satellites, today's archaeologists can literally make discoveries from space. Especially in places where there's dense forest cover, the way satellite archaeology helps us is by enabling us to use the forest itself in order to find those sites that it would otherwise hide. Essentially, sensors on satellites orbiting hundreds of miles above the Earth can pick up very small changes in the way leaves of trees reflect sunlight. And that slight difference led us to new archaeological sites. And everything that you see in red is that high canopied forest. And everything that you see in blue is the low canopied forest. And these sort of discolored greenish yellow patches are archaeological sites. If I zoom in and overlay our map of San Bartolo, you can see the degree to which the known ruins have conformed to that actual vegetation signature. What we were able to do with this high resolution imagery is pick out individual structures hidden beneath the forest canopy. We decided that this location here would be a great place to test. That essentially, we should be able to walk from point A across this area that shows up as red and see no architecture whatsoever. And then upon reaching the other side of that red area, we should be able to find architecture there. And when you do that, there it is. Technology is not just helping archaeologists in the field. The discoveries are just beginning, and once back in the lab, the science really kicks in. Archaeology has come a long ways. And so it came from digging in the dirt every day. It's kind of glorified gardening. And now what we do is we take three-dimensional rendering, and we can actually walk through what it would have been like to, to be there in the site. To me, the future of archaeology is actually here. Now what we can do using computers is to reconstruct archaeological sites in virtual reality. And we rebuild these sites based on the remains. The archaeological classroom of the future is equipped with computers and with projectors that allow us to show digital reconstructions of ancient sites. So what you're seeing is this map scanned and then I go through and model it with the virtual reality tools. And then once we model it, we can raise it into 3D, all the vertical walls first, and then all the horizontal walls, roofs, thresholds, things like that, steps. And then what we can do is, once we get it here into the visualization portal, is we can actually go down into the site. 
So instead of having a blueprint, we can actually bring the site back up into three dimensions. I've been working at Qumran, and Qumran has decided the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Very important documents that tell us a lot about early Judaism. And so what you're seeing, it doesn't exist, but it's based on all the facts, is a reconstruction of some kind of settlement that was once a fortress, then it was abandoned, and then it was reoccupied by a group of people who were responsible for collecting the scrolls that we found in the caves. One of the things that we find at Qumran was very important was the fact that they all ate together. And we know this from the archaeology. Peter, if we could go back towards the millstone, here we go. Now we know that this area in here is a dining hall for a couple of reasons. One, it's the longest room in the building. Number two, there was a pantry just to the south of it. And in the pantry was found like 70 sets of cups, bowls, plates, things like that. And so not only can we model in virtual reality um, the walls of the buildings, but if we find an artifact, we can actually take that artifact, go into a different modeling situation and spin the wheel, actually make the bowl that they would have eaten out of. This was all science fiction for a while. This was kind of the archeology span of the future. But as you can see, this is the archaeology of today. Not just being able to look or read about archaeological remains, but to actually sit here and experience it. To actually walk through an entire site. You really can almost reach out and touch it. This is what it felt like. This is what it looked like. To see what it was like to be in the space. That makes all the difference in the world. Most students come to the class expecting archaeology to be like Indiana Jones. They expect the hat, and they expect the bullwhip. And I pull out a computer. High-tech computer methods are the future of an aspect of archaeology. But you will never get away from digging things up. Ultimately, we're going to have to excavate it to learn much more. So it becomes another tool in the archaeologist's toolkit for doing things in ways that we never even considered doing before. The Grail is mine. And you're going to get it for me. Shooting me won't get you anywhere. You know something, Dr. Jones? You're absolutely right. Dad. Dad. when you're dead. The healing power of the Grail is the only thing that can save your father now. It's time to ask yourself what you believe. The Ark of the Covenant. The Holy Grail. Shankara stones and crystal skulls. Indiana Jones has been on a quest to unearth the greatest lost treasures of mankind. But on his journey into the unknown, could he be searching for something even bigger? Uh, essentially, archaeology, I think, on the grand scheme of things, is just another way to approach the question of, you know, who are we? What are we doing here? You know, you can say the meaning of life, or, or what does it all mean? What made me go into archaeology was to try to find uh, where did I came from culturally because archaeology can give us reasons and answers to a lot of questions that we still have about our past. Archaeological material provides the building blocks for identity and self-knowledge. On my very first archaeological excavation, I found a bronze water vessel. We were wiping off the edge and letters began to appear in Greek. And when I saw these villagers, 50-year-old men, seeing the name of their hometown on this vessel from the depths of this well, they began to weep. And this was the beginning of understanding the importance of this material to the local population in terms of their collective identity. There are four questions that most people cannot answer. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's my purpose here on earth? And what's my future? As a professor, you see the joy on the student's face when you answer those questions which they have been seeking for, you know, all their life.
it is tremendously important to study the past. Because studying the past, first of all, gives us a better sense of ourselves, where we come from, where our structures come from, where what we believe comes from. And with that understanding of where we come from, we have a better sense of where we're going. And we really and truly cannot understand ourselves without understanding where we came from. And that motivates most of us to do this kind of work because it's a discovery of our shared human past that can explain where our ancestors got it right. Where they did amazing things that have been lost to written history. We also are learning about ways that our ancestors really messed things up too. How they collapsed. These ancient societies may have had primitive technology, but they still loved, they still found things beautiful, and so do we. And so by learning about these ancient cultures, we can say, okay, they were different, but they're very much the same. The dead people are not only the dead people. They are also the genes of the future. That's why the relationship with the past is not just a matter of history, it's a matter of survival. We're about to complete a great quest that began almost 2,000 years ago. We're only one step away. The quest is really about finding yourself and perhaps finding God as well. And you're trying to find a home, a home within yourself, a spiritual home, a connection with God. And you're constantly being asked questions. And so you're testing to see, are you worthy to find God? I think man has a inherent desire to connect to their own divinity, their own connection to God. And one of the easiest ways to try and do that is to find ancient objects from a time when spirit and life were more merged, more one. And perhaps instead of through war and destruction, we can find a unifying way to connect as a people. This desire to find something, I think, is everywhere in our modern culture. And we want the quest to be exciting and beautiful, like in Indiana Jones, who makes, you know, hunting in the dirt and the dust really kind of cool. Indiana Jones brings us closer to history. We don't often find academic disciplines that have as much of a superstar as Indiana Jones representing a field like archaeology. Indiana Jones really brings archaeology to a whole new audience. It's a sense that he gives excitement to the quest to understand more about the past. That thing represents everything we got into archaeology for in the first place. It's that sense of discovery. It's that romance. It's that adventure. Jones reconnects you with that childlike passion, that intense appetite to know where we came from, how was it back then, who are we? We need to have heroes like this in life because it keeps us in touch with the fun, the wonder, the discovery of what it is to be a human being.